Are you ready? I feel like God's going to minister in a special way at the conclusion of this service. I already feel it. I want you to know that God has an answer for you. I want to turn your attention to Matthew chapter number 20. I'm reading from the New King James Version, verses 1 through 7. And if you are a guest visitor here today, you're your family now. So we claim you. Well, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning. Everybody say early. Mm -hmm. To hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour. Everyone say third hour. And saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard. And whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. And again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour. And did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle. And said unto them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said unto him, Because no one hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. Now I could have read the entire conclusion of the story, which I think most of you are well aware. And the conclusion of the matter was when payday came at the end of the day, Everybody was paid the same amount. And the people that had been there all day long complained. Because they were jealous over the wages that were earned by those that came at the 11th hour. Which is, of course, one hour before the midnight or the end of the day. I want to preach today on the subject, the 11th hour. Let's ask God to bless his word. Precious God, we thank you today for the word of God, for the power of your spirit, for the hand of the Lord that's in this place to do great and mighty wonders. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said amen. Smile at someone, shake their hand if you have the courage to do it. You may be seated. The study of the end times is called eschatology. And it comes from the word that we are familiar with, escalate. Or some of you shoppers, escalator. But it connotes the idea of a cosmic acceleration that is going to take place as the closing days of Church time. When I say church time, I don't mean the clock that some of you are watching already, but I mean the church dispensation time, the time allotted for the kingdom to do its work on planet Earth. And what we're going to discover in the course of this message, and something of which you already know to a certain extent, and that is there is going to be a cosmic free for all as we enter the last stages of time on earth as we know it. That the enemy is going to throw in his hat with everything he has because he knows his time is short. And that the Lord of glory, come on, he wouldn't be king of kings if he did any less. (laughs) But we'll get there. I want to save your shout till we get there. And so I want to talk about this, uh, this apostolic endgame. I feel like we're in the 11th hour. And of course, endgame is something for you chess players that you're so familiar with. And I'd like to draw an analogy from that old-time tested game. Not because I know how to play it. Uh, what little bit I know about chess, I've had to ask my son. 
and maybe read something in an article somewhere, but something happens in the game of chess which makes it so amazing, and that is as the game progresses toward the end, the power dynamic of the pieces begin to shift. It begins with the queen, you know, being so powerful, but when you get to the end of the game, if if all a queen by herself cannot checkmate a lone king, she needs help. <laughs> it looked like she can do just about everything uh, until you get to the end. Then the king becomes, you know, the beginning of a chess game, the king is kind of like chill. He's kind of protected, and he's kind of out of the way and off the radar, so to speak. But as the game progresses, the king becomes more forceful. And he becomes, and he steps out and begins to make strategic moves. So they say if you lose the queen too early in a game of chess, it's considered to be an insult to your opponent to try to carry on because it's so hard to win if you lose the king, uh, or the queen rather, early in the game. Unless, of course, you're Bobby Fischer. Some of you might remember, I think it was 1959, when a 14-year-old chess player come out of the woodwork, and on the 17th move in a chess game, he sacrificed his queen. And that move gained uh, him the reputation, and he went on to win that chess game uh, against a grandmaster that had won many tournaments. But it earned, uh, that game has been known to this day as the game of the century. Uh, and because of the uh, dynamic and strategic maneuver. Well, I'm not going to preach to you about chess games, so please don't. Uh, this is a, what I'm talking about isn't a game at all, but it is a strategic uh, pitting of the principles of the spirit versus the principalities of the powers of darkness. And I tell you, as we move closer and closer to the coming of the Lord, we need to know where God is. We need to know where we are. And I really believe that we are, God is setting uh, us up to have the revival of the century. Come on, somebody. I, I appreciate everything that God does. I appreciate what he's doing here today. But I, something tells me the best is yet to come because we are being prepared to engage in the battle of the century, and it's going to result in the victory of the ages, and we're going to go out of this world with a shout of triumph. Praise God. Move number 17, this young man sacrificed his queen. Fred Renfield called it one of the most magnificent moves ever made on a chessboard. Grandmaster John Rosam referred to it as one of the single most powerful chess moves of all time. And so here we are. We're standing, amen, in the 11th hour. And just like in a game of chess, as it moves toward the end game, the king, amen, steps out from the corner and begins to make his move. I want to hear, I want you to hear this today. The King of Glory is about ready, amen, to step off his throne and out of his throne room. And he's fixing to get involved in end time apostolic revival like never before. Hallelujah. Does anybody want Jesus to get involved? There's something uh, for you seagoers, sailors, fishermen, whatnot, called a bell buoy. I know you know what a buoy is. That's where they anchor a, a bobbing, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing with maybe a light on it that identifies perhaps the opening into a, a port or into a jetty or maybe marking some dangerous shoals. But sometimes it's not enough just to have a, a, a metal bobbing structure painted red or even having a flashing uh, beacon on it. 
Sometimes a bell is added, and it's, when they add the bell to the buoy, it's called a bell buoy. And uh, what that's for is sometimes the fog is too great, or the storm is too severe, and, and no one can see the light or see the structure. But the bell buoy is designed that the fiercer the storm rages, the louder the bell rings. <clears throat> I said, the fiercer the storm rages, the louder the bell rings. And the devil has convinced some of you that when you're in a storm, you need to be quiet. I want to undo that demonic logic and tell you, the fiercer the storm broods over you, the louder your voice needs to get and the heavens need to ring with the sound of your praises. Not only that, for those of you that feel like your lone voice is lost, uh, amen, among, amid the, uh, the tyranny, the tragedy, the outcry of satanic forces, hear me, the stronger the enemy fights against you, uh, the more, you, if you'll listen, you'll hear the shout of the king among us. Woo! I feel like I can hear the shout of the king among us. Amen. And he is celebrating and anticipating and expecting oh, an end time. Amen. Come on, pull the stops out. Throw everything in the pot. Holy Ghost revival. Okay, so like a game of chess, the 11th hour church is going to experience transformative power. People who thought they were nothing are to become something. People who thought they were something may become nothing. Hello? In the end game, even a pawn, amen, has the possibility of becoming crowned, amen, and becoming something far more important than it ever dreamed that it could be. Philip Yancey, he's a popular Christian author. Uh, he wrote a book that I liked called The Jesus I Never Knew. Well, he tells a story uh, in an article that he wrote about how that when he was in high school, he was quite an accomplished chess player. And, um, and he used the game of chess to demonstrate the problems that arise with people who try to figure out how much God knows and how much God doesn't know concerning the free will predestination problem. The thing when you're trying to think about the free will predestination problem, you end up into one of two dead ends, or yeah, one or the other. Either you, you uh, put so much emphasis on human action that you disable, as it were, uh, the power of God, or you empower God's will so strongly that human beings are nothing more than representatives of free will, but they're really just robots in disguise, and all we do is what God wants us to do, however it works out. Well, listen, both of those answers are wrong. Sometimes the answer to a question is in the middle somewhere. And so I remember taking a course in philosophy, and I remember the question at hand was, this, um, was the problem of determination. So determinism is uh, another kind of, well, it's an academic way of talking about this same problem. So in the realm of science, in the realm of academia, you're supposed to find solutions to problems, relying only on mathematics, only on uh, testable experimentation, and not relying on anything that is mystic or spiritual or divine or otherwise. And so in contemplating this problem, I brought a diagram to the professor, and I remember asking him to look at it. And I said, you know, if in fact the Big Bang set in motion everything that is happening today, and that everything that happens, both molecularly, uh, cosmically, cosmologically in space, and in people, is all the result of like one big explosion at the very beginning, and kind of like a billiard player that hits the racked balls and they go everywhere and that's all that happened 
I said, it's curious to me how that an explosion at the beginning of it all could cause higher and higher orders of complexity as it rolls on throughout time. So that the, the Big Bang created the, uh, the uh, quantum computer and the sophisticated human mind and uh, jet aircraft and men on the moon all from one explosion all explosions we're familiar with tears things apart. But this one is different. It puts everything together on an accelerating scale of complexity. And I showed him a diagram that I kind of uh, used to illustrate. And he looked at me and he said, where did you get that? I said, I just, I just found it online. It isn't related to this topic, but I think it illustrates the point of how, how complicated it is to assume that we have no choice. That everything is accidental. And he looked at me and his face fell. And he said, I've been struggling with this problem for 20 years of my life. I said, if this is true, then the Big Bang had to be God. He nodded his head. He said, I've tried to find a solution for 20 years. And the implied rest of it that he didn't say is, without introducing the idea of God. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You can't find a reasonable solution without God. And so Philip Yancey goes on to say this. So I was a pretty good chess player in high school. I won almost every match I played. Then I laid the board down for 20 years. Then I ran into an old chess uh, uh, mate who kept on playing the game. And they, he suggested, let's play a game of chess. And so they played, and he lost. And they played another game, and he lost again. And they played another, and he lost, and he lost, and he lost. I'll try the French Open. I'll try this open. I'll try this bold and dangerous move. And here's the thing. It, he said this, it didn't matter what he tried. Yancey couldn't beat the chess master, because every time he made a move, the chess master would make another move and use Yancey's move to get his way. So it resulted this, he said, both my good moves and my bad moves, both served the chess master's purposes. Here is how it goes down. Here is how you explain predestination and free will. No matter what you do, he does give you a choice. But no matter what you do, God can take your good choices and even your bad choices and weave them into a plan to get you to heaven if you'll let him. Somebody shout. Hallelujah. Proverbs 19 and 21 in the Amplified Version puts it this way. Many plans are in man's mind, but it is the Lord's purpose for him that will stand. Your plan is nothing compared to God's purpose. Whew. Hallelujah. So then, as we enter in to this 11th hour. I want to call it the apostolic end game. I want you to notice there are four time frames mentioned in Matthew chapter number 20. There is, first of all, early. A lot of times people miss that one. Early. Then there's the third hour. Then there's the sixth hour. Then there's the ninth hour. Then there's the 11th. Early must be the first hour which in a workday would have amounted to 6 a.m. in the morning. So he goes out early, and he finds some that will work. What does the Bible said that Jesus would come to the who first and then to the Greek? This whole thing began early through Abraham, when God called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees that he sought to develop a people for his name. In John 1 and 1, it says he came unto his own early. Who are his own? The Jewish people. But his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power 
to become the sons of God. So I want you to see this. God comes early and first. The gospel must be preached in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the earth. So the early, the early birds are the Jewish people. Then there is the third hour. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place in one accord. There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house. You know. And then in verse number, what is it, 15, the mockers gather and they begin to accuse these people of being drunk. And Peter stands up and preaches to them and says these words, For these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it is but the third, third hour of the day. So let me say this. Uh, the first hour, the Jews couldn't recognize the day of their appearing. Jesus said, if you only knew if you, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you only knew how often I would have gathered you together as a hen does, but you wouldn't do it. So then on the third hour, amen, there's Pentecost. Hallelujah. Pentecost is the apostolic explosion, the birthday of the New Testament church, where he found those that would receive him and he filled them and ignited them with dunamis, Holy Ghost dynamite and gave power to the people of God to serve him. No, we're not drunk anymore like we used to be, but we still get high an awful lot on the spirit of the living God. Have you had a personal Pentecost in your life yet? Have you been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost? If you haven't, you can today. Put your hands together if you believe God. <laughs> then you find the sixth hour mentioned in John chapter number four. In John chapter number four, Jesus sends his disciples to go into the city to buy meat. And it's, he told them uh, before he got there, he said, I must needs go to Samaria. And so he goes to Samaria and outside a town. At the sixth hour, which would have been noon, a time when the sun is the hottest, and then when most hardworking people are taking siestas, and the disciples are gone, a woman comes out to the well to draw water. This is a woman who has chosen to avoid the social interactions that would have been involved in coming to draw water at other more popular times. The reason being, well, she's had six guys in her life, five husbands, six, five that were and one that is not but is. And Jesus waits for the moment to speak to this Samaritan woman whom she surprised at the interaction. How can you, being a Jew, ask of me to give you water? Seems we don't have any dealings with each other. Hallelujah. Well, what she was fixing to find out was they do now. People who thought they were afar off are not afar off now. People who thought they were untouchable are not untouchable now. You may have been banished by your family, but you're not banished by this family. You may be forgotten and overlooked by others, but Jesus won't overlook you today. And, and, and you know the story, and, and then she said, but you know, the well, the well is deep, you don't have anything to draw with. And Jesus looked at her and said, if you only knew who I was and what I had, you would have asked of me living water and, and you would never thirst again. And then they went on and, and she said something like this. We know that when Messiah comes, you know, we worship, we, we worship in this mountain. And Jesus said, there's going to come a time when they're not going to worship in this mountain or in the temple or anywhere else. <laughs> he said, but... There's coming a time when people are going to worship God in spirit and in truth. Somebody say the sixth hour culminated in a revelation in the power of personal worship. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Welcome to the worship hour. Praise God. 
Come on, the sixth hour is the hour of power of Holy Ghost filled worship. It's when you discover that you have something to contribute other than your bodily presence in the house of God, but you have a ten stringed instruments. Clap your hands unto the Lord. That you have a voice box that can make a joyful somebody get a revelation. Come on. We're not going to get there without worship. It won't happen without worship. We won't achieve the divine goal without worship. All right, all right. I think some of you go have an idea of the plan here. So then the ninth hour. The ninth hour happens where we find the first miracle talked about in the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 3. Remember how many times we've talked about getting out of the upper room, hitting street level, We've hung out in the upper room so long that we, we won't even look out the window and see the guy that can't walk by the gate beautiful. But we're so happy polishing our own halos, each other's halos, and patting ourselves on the back and telling each other how great we feel. Has anyone ever stopped to ask the question, how does God feel? When there's somebody out there in front of the gate beautiful who nobody even pays attention to him and he hasn't walked a day in his life. Well, in the third chapter of the book of Acts, we, we're introduced to the ninth hour. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth. Woo, the ninth hour is the hour of miracles. The ninth hour is when it stops just happening for you, but it starts happening to them. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the 11th. Welcome to the end game. When all of a sudden God re-releases apostolic anointing to see people healed and delivered and set free. Oh, does anybody believe God's a miracle worker today? If you do, clap your hands like you believe it. And in the 11th hour, what happens in the 11th hour? Well, it's clear by the text. All of the above. Oh, come on, somebody. (laughs) Yep, in the 11th hour. I believe God's going to visit Israel again. In the 11th hour, there's going to be an anointing of the Spirit. In the 11th hour, the church is going to be anointed in worship. In the 11th hour, there's going to be anointing and the gifts of the Spirit like never before. Come on, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, Welcome to the 11th hour. The Bible says the devil has come down with great wrath because he knows his time is short. If the devil re-energizes and doubles down when he knows he's running out of time, what kind of a God would sit back and let hell invest all of its energy and do nothing? I'm going to tell you, God is going to fight satanic fire with holy fire. There's going to be a showdown in the 11th hour. And the church is right in the middle of it. Oh, my God. This is how we're going to fight this battle. Stand to your feet right now. Fight the battle with worship and praise. Hallelujah. Welcome. Everything goes in the 11th hour. Blind eyes open up. Deaf ears unstopped. Dead bodies raised up again. Fierce demonic control is released. Oh my God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. Hallelujah. Watch out. Watch out in the 11th hour. Don't let a spirit of complaint get a hold of you. The spirit of complaint came from the ones that had been around the church a while. And they said this to the master, we have borne the heat of the day. And you're doing the same with them as you did for us. The master looked at them and said, who are you to tell me what to do with what's my own? Can I say something? The 11th hour Christians got the same compensation that the first hour Christians or the third hour Christians did, but they didn't get it for free. 
Here it is. He paid the third hour people for a whole day's work. He paid them by what they produced. He paid the 11th hour people by what they, for what they suffered. Pain and suffering. What kind of pain and suffering? Neglect. Rejection. He asked them, why are you standing here idle at the end of the day? They said, they didn't say we were taking a break. We went fishing. We took a vacation. They said, no. I don't know. You don't understand the pain of rejection unless you've ever been overlooked. When you wanted to be a part, but you were overlooked. MRI studies have been on the brain where they, 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 they analyze people's brains when they're going through emotional turmoil and the same centers that light up for physical pain light up in the brain when they're suffering rejection. It hurts! <laughs> and the devil tells you, see everybody, nobody notices me, nobody cares. I come against a spirit of rejection today in the name of Jesus. And I want to tell you, can you ready to hear me? I don't care how many times in your life you have felt forgotten. Somebody may have been abandoned by your parents. Somebody may have had the people that should have looked after you turn on you. Somebody may feel like that you're just some kind of a stepchild and you don't belong anywhere. Can I tell you something? The same God that works in the lives of people that have served him for years and blesses them with healings and wonders and joy and power, guess what? You're not going to get lesser of a cut of it. As a matter of fact, God's going to give you catch-up blessing. Why? Because he understands your pain and he understands what it feels like to be rejected of men. I come against the spirit of, come on right now, we're coming against rejection and soul hurt. In the name of Jesus, we come against the spirit of rejection and we pray, oh God, that the hand of the Lord would give somebody a blessing that will catch them up with the rest of us. And make up for the years that the canker worm of pain and suffering, pain and suffering, pain and suffering. If you've experienced pain and suffering, step out from where you are. God wants to do it for you. He wants to catch you up. Someone broke your heart. You lost your job. You got bypassed for a promotion. Come on. It hurts. Your spouse cheated on you. It hurts. Oh, God. Oh, God, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's the 11th hour. You see, in the 11th hour, God makes everything right. God makes everything right. If you have something that's wrong in your life and you need God to make it right, come up here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.